Good evening and welcome to the Cancer Education Series brought to you by Mercy One and Above and Beyond Cancer. My name is Chris Goodale and I'm the Executive Director of Above and Beyond Cancer. We're also brought to you through a grant from the Iowa Cancer Consortium. It's my pleasure each week to introduce the founder of our organization, Dr. Richard Deming, who will introduce our speaker for this evening. Dr. Deming. Great. Thanks, Chris. And welcome, everyone. Uh, tonight we have Greg Fuqua with us. Uh, Greg has uh, spoken to us in the past and has done some programming with us. Greg's from Ames, Iowa, originally. He got his um, ma uh, Bachelor in Fine Arts at the University of Iowa, and then his Master's in Fine Arts at the New Mexico State University, and uh, recently got his Master's in Arts in Clinical and Mental Health Counseling. Um, and he has been involved in both um, art, doing art, teaching art, and in mental health counseling. And he's going to talk to us tonight about the concept of art as therapy and art reflection, finding meaning and purpose. And I've been looking to this conversation all week. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Greg. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Deming. Uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to kind of give you my view into um, how the art world and the mental health counseling world has kind of intersected for me and created a really, um, I think, really cool and meaningful program as it revolves around cancer survivorship. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a PowerPoint with you. So um, this has been a wonderful journey for me. And a little bit more about myself is um, I grew up with some cancer tragedy in my own life. And when I was 18, my father um, started urinating blood and quickly found out that um, he had a pretty um, evasive cancer in his bladder. And he died nine months from that diagnosis. Um, and the week of his funeral, my mom was, um, called me and was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And she fought that cancer for 10 years and, and then passed as well. Um, and so in some sort of way, um, this has been a healing journey for me to come back and to work with cancer survivors and in some ways process my own grief and my own terror around this disease. When my dad passed, I, um, I, I suddenly had stomach problems <laughs> all the time. Now I know that a lot of grief is carried in our stomachs, actually. And I, and I went to, um, at that time, um, student health clinic, University of Iowa. They didn't know what was wrong. They couldn't figure out what's wrong. And I suffered from that problem for a long, long time. And as a counselor, I now realize that there are very few people I interact with who don't have, who have serious mental health issues. I don't also have some sort of physical presentation or somatic presentation of, um, of those things. And so um, that's something that I've kind of discovered along the way. Um, and then my story to get to be a counselor has also been kind of a crazy one too, which I'll touch on really quickly which is um, I started teaching art um, back in geez, 1997. Okay, I'm going back to the <laughs> previous century. Um, so I've taught art and been a professional artist for 23 years. I remember teaching my first figure drawing class and having a student run up to me and say, Mr. Fikwa, you are, have, are you gonna go into art therapy? what do you know about art therapy? And I was like, oh, well, thank you so much, you know, but no, I'm just, you know, I kind of took it as a compliment, didn't think anything much of it, but I knew I incorporated a lot of sort of inner work and internal expression and exploration with my students. 
and really did things to help them connect to their stories, to their strengths, to their limitations, and how to grow in that, and um, how to tell their stories. And, and then as serendipity would have it, Above and Beyond Cancer was collaborating with the Drake Community Press. I was teaching at Drake at the time as an adjunct studio professor, and I was again teaching figure drawing. And one of the lead interns happened to take my class that summer. And as I heard the story, Above and Beyond Cancer was wanting to do something with art and cancer survivorship. And she said, I know the perfect person. And then I was contacted and I don't even know if she knew at the time, but I was in my program getting my degree in counseling at that time as I was still teaching artwork. And then um, the rest is history, so to speak. Um, and I've done this program twice since um, COVID has kind of created a gap there. Um, and we're looking to do a, um, another program, another class this fall. And so I would just say to people, if there's interest in that, reach out to me. Um, I'm looking to try to um, build towards that um, starting in September. So feel free to reach out to me. Um, part of my story is, um, you know, moving from art to counseling. The image you see in the background right now is a drawing I made. It's a huge drawing. It's about six foot charcoal drawing. It's still... I say looms over me in my living room as cancer did for me um, ever since my parents had passed. And my aunt has also passed, my uncle also passed, my grandmother also passed from cancer. And so in many ways I've seen myself as a cancer survivor and feeling the loom of that disease over me. When I quit art, which I quit at some point, the last image that came out was this one, the one you're seeing. And I think it's a poignant image because it's made me realize that the whole time I was working as an artist, I was doing art therapy for myself. And this was something I had never gotten to, which is basically the ominous presence of cancer in my family and in my life. Two of the biggest sort of values that I believe people need for healing, I have listed here, which is the need for expression and the need for connection. And you're gonna hear this theme repeated um, throughout my talk today. A big part of this is going to also be kind of my philosophy on healing and how I see the bi-directional relationship between our emotions, stress, and our body and our overall health. And then sort of the second part, I'll kind of get into more than nuts and bolts of my program, what that kind of looks like, show you some examples, and um, we'll just kind of dive in from there. If you do have questions, do feel free to, to jump in where you can. I'd be happy to answer those. And I'm sure there's stuff I will jump over and miss as I'm going to. So feel free to do that, okay? So one thing that I've come and that's become more solidified in me um, as a counselor is to understand that the body and our body system a lot of times functions as a teacher or as I tell my clients a lot as a warning system. I mean, what are the, when are the sensations we're having? What are we feeling? How are things in our body manifesting to give us some warning signs? And so it's important to know that the immune system is also, I believe, you know, inseparably tied to um, healthy emotional expression. And so a big part of my philosophy and philosophy around this program is healing through social emotional health. And again, social and emotional health is another way of thinking about connection through, um, through social interaction and expression through emotional expression. There is growing and growing research in the connections between stress, emotions, um, cancer outcomes, and it's documented that emotional expression and social supports, lower levels of stress and particularly emotional distress are associated with improved survival times in cancer patients. It's also documented that behaviors of self-sacrifice and emotional suppression are often found 
as traits of patients who've been diagnosed with cancer. And so we'll kind of get into this a little bit more and I'll give you some more examples of this. One of the big fields that are emerging that are studying this is a field called psychoneuroimmunology or PNI, which is much easier to say. The PNI is basically the scientific inquiry of the bi-directional relationship between psychology and the biological processes and implication of these relationships on health. Chronic stress significantly affects the function of the immune system as well as modifies the evolution of a variety of diseases as psychosocial interventions are proved to be effective in their therapy. And there's some good examples of this. And one that I'll highlight here is um, this professor, Professor Kavita Vedhara, who's a medical professor of health psychology at the University of Nottingham. She did a very compelling study as it related to the efficacy of the flu vaccine, looking at stressed caregivers of dementia patients. And so what she did is she looked at what was the flu efficacy rate and, and the efficacy of the flu, I believe is when you have a threefold increase of antibodies to fight the flu, then it's considered efficacious. And she looked at, well, what's the baseline here? Meaning let's take a look at them as they are as stress caregivers and what the efficacy rates for the flu vaccine were. They're extremely low, um, about 19% they found that the flu vaccine was was effective for stressed caregivers. Then she went ahead and did an intervention involving group work and psychological work and developing of stress coping skills, um, a several week program. And then in the same, uh, not the same people, but in the same sort of stressed caregivers group, they looked at what was the efficacy after that. And they found that it went up to over 50%. So really compelling stuff in terms of how does stress, how does expression and connection impact and affect our immune system? There's other things to look at too, to see, see sort of these connections. And I'll have a bunch of links at the end of um, my PowerPoint that, um, that can give you some resources and links to, to look into this further. Another big voice for this is Dr. Gabor Mate, um, amazing speaker. Encourage you to go read his book, When the Body Says No, or just take a look also at some of his lectures around the book tour of When the Body Says No that are on YouTube and other places too. Um, and he, he compiles an, an, an amazing amount of information um, around the subject. And he says, quote, emotional stress is a major cause of physical illness. From cancer to autoimmune conditions and many other chronic diseases, the brain and body systems that process emotions are intimately connected with the hormonal apparatus, nervous system, and in particular, the immune system. And so he often says, these systems are not separate. They're one system. There is no separation necessarily between the body and the mind. These things are very inextricably interrelated. Lydia Temeshock, another important voice that's looked more specifically at emotional expression, healing, and cancer. In her pioneering work, Temeshock used a combination of interviews, psychometric tests, and other methods to relate the coping styles and psychological adaptation of cancer patients to disease progression. Temeshock's conclusions were that emotional suppression and repression is associated with poor outcomes in cancer patients. It doesn't seem like that big of an epiphany, right? It seems like anecdotally, this makes a lot of sense, right? But it's actually taken a long time to kind of, to kind of get there, to really look at these correlations and to understand the impact and the importance of our mental health and how that impacts our physical health. She also said that the expression of positive and negative emotions is a consistent quality in survivors. She says, through transforming behaviors, some people with cancer become, quote, more expressive, assertive, and self-nurturing, right? Super important, super healthy habits. Um, and so 
in a lot of ways, cancer can help us heal ourselves in a way, or can be that warning system for us. Like what is going wrong? How do I need to relook at my life and reclaim my life in a healthier and stronger way? She wrote that for survivors, there's often, quote, a fundamental shift in their relationship to self and to the world. By deepening their awareness of inner needs and feelings and by expanding to make more genuine contact with others, creates healing between the split of mind and body and a remarkable improvement in emotional and physical health. This, in a nutshell, is what I'm trying to do through this program. There are other examples of that that we can talk about. Um, and two of them cited here, one from the University of California, Los Angeles, in the Journal of Psychosomatic Research. And I'm gonna give you another kind of quick one, which is a study that was done in Australia. 550 women who had lumps in their breasts of sufficient size to require biopsy before the cancer tests were completed, they gave these patients um, a psychological assessment and two major questions were used here. Number one, was the patient um, have a major stressor um, recently? And then the other question is, were those people emotionally isolated? Meaning, did they have supports? Did they have social supports? Did they have outlets of supports? themselves. And the results were kind of striking that neither one of those things in themselves contributed to the likelihood that that uh, lump was cancerous. But when both were present, when the patient both had a major stressor and lacked social supports or was emotionally isolated, the likelihood of that lump being cancerous went up nine times which again is, is sort of compelling. And so maybe it's not stress, but chronic stress maybe does have a deep impact on, on our bodies and our health. I think another good way of thinking about this is um, there is a, there's this guy, Bruce Lipton, who's a microbiologist, and he describes really well the function of cells. And one thing he tells about the cells in the body is they can be in either one of two states at any time. They can't be in, in those states, one of those states at both at the same time. And one of those states is a state of growth and the other state is a state of defense. And, and, and part of what tells our bodies to do that depends on where we're at emotionally, you know, where we're at in terms of our own sense of our own growth or our own defense and sort of what posture and, and how does stress play into that, into sort of the programming of our cells and our bodies. William Osler, who's um, a doctor from early, let's say the early 20th century or late 19th century, I think says something really compelling here, which it's much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease than what sort of disease a patient has. And I think it's a good way of understanding how important the relationship is to healing and to healthcare. And when a patient, or as I see it as a client, has a facilitator who believes in them, trusts them, feels safe, feels secure, feels like they're known, feels like they're connected to them. And when the doctor or the facilitator believes in them, when the client believes in the doctor and that relationship is strong, even with the same techniques and the same tools, outcomes get a lot better. And the importance of that is striking. And striking in counseling is one of the first things they teach us is like, it doesn't matter what you do, but it does matter what kind of relationship you have with the client. You can use any tools or techniques that you want, but the thing that's most impactful is that relationship. And I think that goes to kind of to speak about that. So on the right side here, there's kind of big three takeaways here for me. 
Number one is you can't separate the mind from the body and you can't separate the person from the environment, but often people do. And even doctors do. And we even think of these things as separate things, but we need to think of these things as one thing. Number two, over time, our coping and emotional patterns get reinforced and become rigid parts of our personality that remain unexamined. So this isn't about blaming people for their disease because it's unintentional and these things are unconscious, right? Three, we are complex neurobiological creatures. We are physical as well as spiritual, social, and a human beings. And it's an important perspective, a more holistic perspective we need to have. Oops. I just lost my screen. Let's go back. <laughs> we talked about how sometimes our adversities can become that thing that helps us reclaim our lives in different in new ways. And Gabor Mate talks about this. He says, you know, why, when we have cancer, we have a catastrophe ha happen in our lives, we're gonna ask ourselves, why? Why did this happen to us? And maybe our catastrophes have come along to help us point us back to our true selves or to help further find our true self or our best selves in a way. You can think of this this way. So in existential psychology, I mean, in, when you're dealing with this type of disease, you're gonna have existential questions about, you know, how do we find meaning through this? And I think this is an important part of why art therapy is an important avenue in um, more holistic ways of thinking about healing through survivorship. And another important existential thinker, Viktor Frankl, read his book if you haven't, you just have to, it's Man's Search for Meaning. Um, he was um, imprisoned in the Nazi concentration camps. His whole family was killed in the Nazi, he survived. Um, and he talks about how he survived. And then there's some really important quotes that come out of that book that end up being really powerful. Two of them are, between stimulus and response, there's a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. When we are no longer able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So he really talks about that this idea that challenging experiences lead to identification of values, perspective, growth, and strength. And where we find our power is in our response. Rollo May, another existential psychotherapist and scholar. He believed that we heal ourselves through our own wounds through our own challenges, through our own adverse life experiences. He thought the best healers, teachers, and artists came from a place of trial and struggle. He said that these people have a greater understanding of their vulnerability, complexity, and humanity, and how to be adaptable, resilient, and creative. He's got some kind of famous quote that talks about that he, he, didn't, he never wanted a well-adjusted therapist for himself. He wanted somebody who knew about the human experience. He said that courage is not the absence of despair, it's rather the capacity to move ahead in spite of despair. And again, the takeaway here for me is creative individuals use struggles to help define themselves, to help find more meaning and to help find their true selves or higher selves. So Research suggests that the following good qualities can be learned, developed further and used and that bad qualities can be minimized as it relates to chronic disease in our health and particularly cancer. So personal qualities are associated with a good prognosis include the idea of having a fighting spirit, positive avoidance, which sort of means, which is a fancy way of saying live, go live your life, go take on life. And it's a wonderful message that really mirrors what above and beyond cancer is really about. 
having strong supportive relationships, again, connection, and the ability to cope effectively and flexibly with stress. We've seen the impacts of stress here. Factors associated with a poor prognosis, fatalism, um, anxiety and depression, suppression of emotions, lifestyle of isolation, poor family relationships during childhood, low socioeconomic status and major losses, and really we can just say trauma right there. And if anybody's familiar with the ACEs study or the Diverse Childhood Experiences study that was done over the lifetime of some people that went through trauma, it's really compelling stuff to see how trauma impacts our physical health and our mental health later on in life. Obviously there's physiological stresses that I'm kind of focused on a lot, but there's also physical stresses too, right here too. There's also genetic component to all this stuff too, for sure. Why do I keep doing that? Okay. So now I'm gonna sort of get into the program a little bit more and kind of goes over, kind of gone over a little bit of my philosophy, how I think about this, why I think this is important. Um, again, you may see some more of my artwork sort of in the backgrounds and places here. So the program is, I call um, the lessons of art, art of therapy for cancer survivors. And obviously the reason um, it has that title is because I think there's a lot we can learn through art making and a lot it has to teach us about living um, that um, can be very powerful in itself, but also very healing as people have gone through their own challenges and adversities and needing a place for expression and needing a place to process. The overlap between personal growth, psychology and create creativity is really striking. And a good way to think about this is that creativity is sort of the, the opposite of, of stuckness. And stuckness is basically an inelegant but highly descriptive term to describe the opposite of intentionality, the lack of creativity. And so part of what we're teaching is, is also how to be creative, how to rethink about ourselves, how to, again, how to reclaim our lives and re-enliven ourselves to our lives in different ways. On the right, there is a quote from Eric Fromm, which is really, I think, really an important way of thinking about creativity. He says that creativity requires the courage to let go of certainties. And when you've been diagnosed with cancer, um, a lot of certainties go away pretty quick. Um, I think another good way of thinking about creativity is, is, you know, is finding yourself through losing yourself, sort of a rediscovery process. How, how can I expand? So I, I think there's three big takeaways of, in, in, uh, in art making. One is a brace not knowing. So learning and growing is not about knowing or understanding because if you do, there's, there's nothing to do. It's about giving ourselves the space or the freedom for discovery to be trusting a process, accepting and to embrace the journey, again, the process, not the outcomes. Number two, fear is good. Experiencing doubt's a good sign. It means you're partnering with your creativity and you're growing. And, and courage is, is a good way to think about this as a twin attribute of fear and vulnerability. And then art making also connects us to this idea of flow. And when we can think about it in terms of process orientation or being in the moment. But I think flow, a good way of thinking of flow is when things are kind of almost happening on their own. You're losing your sense of self. You're dissolving and being completely immersed and connected into that moment. And there is sort of a dissolving of that space and time and self all in that one, one moment in the here and now. So I call this the Greg Fuqua theory of creativity. And 
it, it's kind of funny because it's so many students would ask me, um, I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do? And um, how do I grow? How do I get better? You know, and so I remember, I don't know if it was a moment of frustration or epiphany or both, but I'm like, okay, hold on. I got it. And so I just went up to the chalkboard in front of the class. I'm like, I want you to understand this one thing. I want everyone to understand what this is. And so there's sort of two sides here, right? Um, there's the tendency on the left and there's a fear on the right. And in the middle is this place of tension, which is, I think, where creativity happens. And our tendency is to remain in the know, right? And if we stay in the know and we can't really be creative, do we need a place to start? Sure. Do we need a sense of ourselves as a place to start? Absolutely. Those are really good things. But if we stay there, we're basically in stuckness and we're doing the same thing over and over again. We're going to get frustrated. We're going to get tired. We're going to get uninspired. So we actually have to push into the unknown. We have to do things that feel less familiar right in order to understand what is our potential how can i see myself differently this can be really powerful another tendency might be acceptance which is i accept the way i am this is how i am done and i say no what's this is what you do okay but let's push more into denial let's try to do it a different way in fact you know a lot of times um, i remember my professors in art school i remember one of them in particular i brought in some work and he said to me, Greg, this is awesome stuff. Now I want you to go back in the studio and do the opposite. <laughs> and I was like, what? Um, okay, it was good, but I need to do the opposite. And then I was like, oh, I get it. This was about this. And I need to go in an opposite direction, meaning this informs me about where to go, right? That's what process is about, is about taking one step, being responsive to it, and letting it direct me, letting it inform me, letting it teach me. Another tendency might be to be comfortable. I'd rather have you actually get in a position where you kind of feel lost. And, and, and in all these situations, it means that you may not have great outcomes, right? Um, but you will be free. And you will also be free to discover. And I think that's the most important thing is, is it's not about things don't have to work out. But we have to have the freedom to allow ourselves to find it out. And those are really good lessons that art teaches. So what does this class entail? Well, number one, it's 13 weeks. Okay, so let's just get some of these basics out of the way. It's, it's a 13 week class. We meet once a week for three hours and it involves these four elements. Number one, psychoeducation. Okay, psychoeducation is kind of what I'm doing here, which is sort of educating you on on um, principles of psychology. Two is group talk therapy. So there's, there's a place to share and to process. And some of that we do also some art therapy sorts of stuff in there. Um, sketching, writing, um, sharing, journaling work, stuff like that. And this ends up in terms of the feedback I've gotten from the evaluations of the class is the most powerful component, surprisingly enough, but it contains both, right? Connection and expression, one. There's also guided meditation and mindfulness practices that we do. And art puts us there already. Okay. And then, of course, there's artist therapy projects or art, art therapy projects. And we do 2D, we do individual work, we do collaborative work, we have journal work every week. We have themes too every week. We kind of deal with sort of some big issues as it relates to things that. Um, apply for cancer survivorship. And then we also have a four week period right in the middle that's all about clay work. And we do um, some pottery wheel work and hand building. And, and the theme around this is, is kind of a connection to our body and a rebranding of our senses. And that ends up being a really wonderful time. So what's psychoeducation? It's a class lecture. Right. It deals, it also introduces our weekly themes. It's intended to educate, elicit thoughts, emotions, inspiration, and sharing and discussion. Some of the weekly class themes, and some of these have changed, some of them have stayed acceptance, resiliency, the body, right? Thriving, courage, control, awakenings, trust. Um, we've talked about death too, um, which ended up being kind of a scary topic, but extremely powerful. 
um, uh, group talk therapy. Group therapy allows the members to participate and observe interpersonal relationships and dynamics and therefore presents opportunities for relating different in the moment. And this is where self-discover and reflection are essential. And you wouldn't believe how many um, people have had difficulty in relationships in their lives that um, and we all have um, that become so wonderful to be in a supportive place where people are listening, people are with you, and people share their emotions, their experiences. And it, it's a wonderful thing to be heard and to be understood and to be validated. And it's 90% of what I do as a counselor. And when someone is heard and validated, their nervous system calms down. It's such a relief to have somebody tell you exactly what you needed to tell somebody else and for them to be alongside you that whole way and get it absolutely right. Studies have indicated a direct beneficial effect of social supports on cancer survival times. The first most publicized study of Spiegel et al showed that at a 10 year follow-up, there's a statistically significant survival advantage for women with breast cancer who had participated in group therapy treatment. And being a teacher, group work, relational work, doing collaborative work is just right up my alley. And it's, it's really a great thing. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. I always tell people, we know ourselves better in relationship. In fact, we would have no clue who we were if we didn't have stuff to relate to and people to relate to, right? It's really important. The guided meditation and mindfulness stuff, okay? And, and core mindfulness essentially is paying attention in a particular way on purpose in a present moment and non-judgmentally being able to be okay and accepting of what is. Bringing one's complete attention to the present experience on a moment to moment basis. So self-awareness, another good way of thinking about it is engaged curiosity. And then this little cartoon on the right, I think is, is, is maybe the easiest way to understand <laughs> the catharsis of art therapy. Um, and there truly is an entanglement in our heads a lot of times that we need to get out. And basically this allows for unfiltered expression, release catharsis and mental processing, sports themes, feelings, emotions, identity. It is a mindfulness practice. And it um, helps explore the unconscious and subconscious parts of our of our bodies, minds, feelings, et cetera. Heighten self-reflection, self-regulation, self-awareness. It increases per sensory, perceptual, tactile, and spatial creativity. So art teaches us what are the lessons to challenge and discover more of ourselves, to become self-compassionate, accepting, to be self-aware, to be inspired, to draw upon our attributes, our experiences, good and bad, and strengths to find meaning and connection in ourselves and to the things we do, to be creative and to move forward. It teaches us how to live, to grow, and to thrive. Special van der Kolk describes, critical to the quality of our lives, our imagination enables us to leave our routine everyday existence by play and fantasy. All the things that make life interesting, Imagination gives us the opportunity to envision new possibilities, an essential launch pad for making our hopes come true. It fires our creativity, relieves our, bo our boredom, alleviates our pain, enhances our pleasure, enriches our most intimate relationships. Here's some um, exercises that I've sort of included for you to see some of the stuff I've done. This is stuff that I actually did in my art class, you know, and then and then my students running to me, hey, you know, are you interested in art therapy? Yada, yada, yada. Anyhow, we basically just take a plain still life, but the still life had to be expressed through a theme that was usually an emotion 
or um, adjective or an adverb, something like that. And you can see how our perception and our emotional state can change the way we see ourselves and how we relate to our lives, right? And what I used to do here is, is you know, do a lot of sort of meditation and visualization beforehand. So I want you to get connected to a really stressful moment you've had last week. I want you to feel what that's like in your body. And now I'm like, now go, draw. <laughs> Expressing our emotions is healing too. And so we've, we have some emotional and uncomfortable emotions and positive emotions exercises that usually get shared in sometimes our journals um, and sometimes through um, some of the journal prompts I use and sometimes in class. And here are a couple of those. And you sort of imagine what's being expressed here opposed to what's being expressed here opposed to what's being expressed here, which is really interesting. This middle piece is one I did with one of my clients who sort of got into this really dark area. And then she was doing these soothing and almost suppressing motions over top of it, back and forth, back and forth. This is a drawing and a letter that was left me in my last semester as an art teacher at Grandview. She said, I had recently quit a job I've held for over three years now. I was underappreciated when I broke my back, dismissed when I should have been thanked. I put up with enough at this company. I shouldn't have expected much. I broke down myself mentally and physically, and I only feel remorse and guilt for quitting something that was killing me. I wanted to feel free, but instead I feel ashamed and useless. The blue is what I want to feel free and beautiful. Instead, I'm like the black and closed and ripped apart and dying. You know, and you can understand how important this processing is with the intensity of what's expressed there, right? Um, completely abstract but very intense. And you, you have to be able to process that. You have to actually get that out. And every time I read that letter, it just kind of brings me to tears. How do we make ourselves whole again? Which I think is a really good title to kind of look at some of the work that was done. And this comes from my first class. One thing we did is a mural project. And in the mural project, I basically told all the participants, all right, we're doing a mule project. The only thing I'm gonna tell you is you all have to participate and you have to come up with your own theme. And this theme of these separate puzzle pieces that feet together, that complete each other and tell each other stories in a little spot was really powerful. And so each of these spaces represents um, someone's story in some way. And there's a lot of symbolism in this orange area at the bottom middle. We had um, one of the participants that was too sick to come. And so everybody basically wrote something in there to still symbolize their presence and impact on the group. This is some body work that we did. And these were big sheets of paper where um, participants traced each other out and then were able to kind of reclaim the story of their body and what they've been through. Another sort of really powerful process. And there's some people like, well, I'm not an artist. I don't know what to do. Well, believe me, there's a ton of both materials that I have, processes and exercises that can um, find avenues of expression for you. It's not about this idea that there's some strange standard that you have to meet. Um, and one of the ladies that I worked with in the first session told me over and over again, she wasn't an artist, she wasn't an artist, she wasn't an artist, but made one of the most powerful pieces, individual pieces um, I'd ever seen. 
period in my 23 years of teaching. But she was conceptual. She was intelligent. And we found an avenue for her that was super powerful. And I'll tell her story really quick. She had unexpressed negative emotions, which is again, a real, neg a real negative for, for a cancer prognosis. You know, um, that suppressed negative emotion is not a good thing, right? Um, and so what, <laughs> what she would do is she would go to her garage and she would buy like, like Dollar General cups, like a coffee cups, and she would go and throw them on the ground and smash them. And it really represented, um, right, that expression of anger. Um, but there was a bigger story there. And she ended up taking this theme of shattered. And she took home a ceramic piece. And she built it up. And she dropped it on the floor. And then re-glued it back together. And called it shattered. And it was a beautiful mess. It really was. It's a way to sort of reclaim her life really powerful way. And these two examples are good examples of processing that people did with writing, right? With word mapping, you know, um, which is really cool. There's some really simple ones that people can do um, to start out. And one of the first things, um, I do with the class is, is, is a really, well, there's this refinement drawing is here now, but underneath there's this one called make a drawing. Oh, make a drawing by meaning as changes as possible. And refinement drawing, drawing in the here and now, which I'm gonna kind of uh, skip over kind of quickly. And go to this one, which is drawing emotions and how do you feel? This one was, is an amazing exercise. It's so really strange things come out of it. Basically kind of get people to stop and to slow down, close their eyes and they can use either one hand or both hands or their left hand if they're right-handed, I like people to use because it's more connected to your right or emotional side of your brain. And basically I let them kind of just feel on the paper and let some energy out and let their sort of mind and their emotions wander. And I even call it it's something like a size monitor, a size, yeah, like a, a size size seismometer. Am I saying that right? Or a polygraph, which is kind of, you know, tracing your kind of inner world and letting it come out in abstract ways. And this this was the first exercise I did with my art therapy client class for cancer survivors. And I'll give you two quick stories. One was of a woman who's, um, whose cancer markers, her blood markers were going up, 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 up. And she thought for sure, and she had lupus, she thought for sure she was going to have a recurrence of her cancer. And um, she'd ha already had a hysterectomy and she just knew it was coming back in her internal organs somewhere or in her reproductive organs, somewhere in that area. And we did this exercise and she opened up her eyes and started crying. And there was a drawing of a, of a hips, of the bones, like the hip bone, both sides. And in the middle was a searching, 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 searching line. And she had no clue what she was drawing. It just came out. Another gal who used mantras to kind of keep her um, balanced and centered. She was, she was using this phrase, just be, just be, just be. And, and again, in hers, she also had these, this crazy chaotic circle of stuff. And in the middle, right through the middle was a continuous line that was a cursive B and a cursive E that connected the other side. It was still, it was in the middle and she was just blown away can be a powerful exercise and just a very easy and simple one to try where you're not trying to draw something, right? It's just an outlet for energy and expression. And then you can turn it into something or you can see stuff in it a lot of times. And that's 
that's the amazing thing about it. So I think there's two good questions to ask yourself as it relates to my philosophy and your social emotional health. Just where in your life do you need to more often say no or yes, right? Where in life do you suppress self-sacrifice or feel most conflicted? And then, you know, where do you feel this in your body? And, and a lot of people don't think about this, but a, a lot of our emotions, a lot of our thoughts, a lot of our parts are, are kind of manifest in our bodies. And then what does this have to tell you about the story of your life, your childhood, or even your physical ailments? That's a good question. I mean, I encourage you to start looking into more about those who are healing and thriving through art and expression, the connections between um, health, physical health and emotional health. And I have a bunch of them here, okay? And know that anybody is welcome to um, this PowerPoint. Go ahead and email me um, and reach out and I'll be happy to share more with you. And again, if you're interested in the program, again, reach out. I do interview everybody. I want to get to know you. I want to make sure it's right for you. And, um, you know, love to have you reach out if you're interested. Okay. Hey, Greg, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah. Uh, yeah, let's let's engage in a little bit of conversation here. If, uh, if you are done with the PowerPoint, maybe have you close that and that way we can see each other a little bit better. So I am really excited about the program that we're going to be doing this fall. And I just want to follow up with a, a couple of questions. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, you've had people that participate. They go, I'm not an artist. I'm not an artist. Now, obviously, the purpose of this program is not to turn someone into a professional artist to sell their artwork for lots of money. Um, that, that's not the goal of art as therapy. And listening to your talk, it, it seems that art provides us that opportunity, especially if we're not an artist. This, this not knowing, this feeling of vulnerability, especially in a group setting. I mean, it's not like I'm sitting in a closet right. artwork <laughs> that nobody else is going to see. I mean, but, but obviously that vulnerability and not knowing is is a source of creativity and ingenuity and ultimately insight and i think you know i'm hearing you say and i'm just asking you to expand upon this the insight that might come to us because again the goal of this program is not to create a professional artist i would say the goal is to help you feel better by providing some insight. And that insight might come from um, not knowing, vulnerability, exploring things in a safe environment with others who are also on the exploratory track. And, and maybe comment on how you think this does allow individuals to find insight. Um, and, and, and part of this is theory, you know, how much of it is the artwork, but how much of it is the surrounding support and the framework of human beings together on a journey? Um, just really great insight, Dr. Deming. Um, wonderful thoughts for sure. Um, and and I think you bring up some really important points and um, I can't stress enough how powerful, you know, um, the interactions um, in the art room are for people. And you're right, there's tremendous vulnerability of, of, of that feeling of, of not knowing and how will I be judged and how will I be seen. What's wonderful is there's in incredible acceptance and, and art's not, a deficit focused field, <laughs> right? It's about what can you do and who are you? And art celebrates our uniqueness. There is no standard for creativity. And it, and it is about that you have a voice and you have an important voice, whatever that looks like. And that's what really becomes powerful is some of these also sort of um, 
interactive artwork that we do, which creates safety in those numbers. Like in the mural pieces, like you are one piece of this big, beautiful mosaic, right? And you become part of something bigger when you give into that vulnerability, you give into that process when you're allowed to just be yourself without judgment, with acceptance. And um, there is just a lot of power there, right? And then what we discover is more than we expect almost always, you know, um, because we're, we're going into unknown territory a lot and we're allowing for that. And so there's a tremendous sense of release and a freedom of burden and non-judgment around ourselves, you know, um, and the discoveries about our voice and who we are um, are an important part of the program. And again, part of that is right, identifying who we are and who might we more become, you know? Um, and so there's some people that have predilections that are very detail oriented. Well, what do they do when they get these alcohol inks that will not stay anywhere and they spread out and have tremendous color and effect and suddenly you're victim to this whole thing that's going on before you. Um, or, or the opposite, you know, where um, someone ha someone gets on the potter's wheel and is like, how do I work with this thing? And how do I think about this sensitively? And how do you become more present and aware of yourself and celebrating yourself and celebrating each other and wherever you're at in that moment? And that's what it's about. It's, and it's not about making great art. In fact, one of the things I used to do to my art students that were particularly um, control oriented and highly skilled is I would say, now we're gonna do an ugly painting and it's gotta be ugly. <laughs> it's gotta be ugly. And what's funny is that it was never ugly. It was always beautiful, but they had to expand their sense of what was beautiful and, and how they saw the world and what that looked like always came out as an area of growth and rediscovery about themselves. Yeah, that's great. Hey, well, I really appreciate um, your, your speaking with us tonight. I really am looking forward to Above and Beyond Cancer partnering with you to offer this program. Um, we're not ready to announce dates and locations, but we, we've got a great location. We think we're going to have this, and I think there's going to be the opportunity not only to make art, but also to use existing art, you know, as, as a, a springboard to delving into ourselves. So we'll, we'll keep everyone informed. And if you're interested in being a member of the artist therapy that's going to happen this fall, please uh, let Greg know or let us know at aboveandbeyondcancer.org. And uh, we'll keep everybody posted. And Greg, I think maybe we'll do a follow up after the program and maybe we'll have you and some of the artists and share some of the artwork that comes out of it for those that want to share. You know, for some, it's a very personal process and it's not necessarily uh, being made for public uh, consumption or view. But for some, I, I know from the last group are, are very excited about sharing the experience that they have. So I'm going to turn it back over to my friend, Chris Goodale, who's going to close us out for the night. And we're actually sharing the same computer. So I'm going to go off stage and he's going to come on. Greg, thank you very much. Very informative as always. And uh, we, as Dr. Deming said, we will keep everyone informed as to when that art as therapy courses uh, online, so to speak, uh, with with you and uh, we'll let everybody know the details. So that'll be great. Uh, this has been recorded this evening and like all of our cancer education series sessions, it will be on our YouTube channel uh, tomorrow morning. And it will also be available on the Mercy One website if you search cancer education series. So Greg, thanks very much. And uh, we will look forward to staying connected with you throughout the summer. And of course, uh, for your class in the fall. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. All right. Bye, all.